Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Hugh McKay, President of the Board of Directors of the City Club. The City Club is pleased to welcome Ohio Senior Senator Sherrod Brown. Senator Brown joins us remotely from Washington, D.C., where he had to be present today for the Senate vote on the Cut, Cap, and Balance Act. One prominent political pundit believes that Sherrod Brown is the most visionary, most dynamic, and effective senator in the history of the U.S. Senate. But that's just Connie Schultz's view. <laughs> no. Sherrod Brown has indeed had a long and distinguished career of public service. Born and raised in Mansfield, Ohio, he achieved the rank of Eagle Scout in the Boy Scouts, then graduated from Yale and earned master's degrees from The Ohio State University. He served two terms as Ohio Secretary of State, four terms in the Ohio House of Representatives, and then seven terms in the U.S. House of Representatives. In the House, <clears throat> then Representative Brown became one of Congress's most respected voices on health care, affordable prescription drugs, as well as on trade policy, job creation, and the environment. He was the chief Democratic sponsor of the bipartisan landmark Children's Health Act of 2000, and the American Public Health Association recognized Congressman Brown as its Distinguished Public Health Legislator of the Year. On the U.S. House and Senate Great Lakes Task Force, Congressman Brown led the charge to halt attempts by private companies to buy and sell Great Lakes water. In the Senate since January of 2007, Senator Brown has worked closely with the Obama administration on the creation of a national manufacturing policy and has pushed to make Ohio a national leader in clean energy manufacturing. He's also been a leading force in the Senate on fair trade and health care reform. Senator Brown is just the sixth Ohio senator in history to serve on the powerful Senate Appropriations Committee. He also serves on the Senate Banking Committee, and is chairman of its Financial Institutions and Consumer Protection Subcommittee. On the Senate Veteran Affairs Committee, Senator Brown has done much good work for our veterans, and he is the first Ohio senator in 40 years to serve on the Senate Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry Committee, where he's been instrumental in strengthening the farm safety net and addressing childhood hunger. In short, it is not surprising that his job duties have him back in our nation's capital today. So, live from Washington, D.C., please welcome to the City Club, Senator Sherrod Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you for, for everyone, everyone there. there who showed up. I appreciate that. I appreciate the being the first um, City Club Skyping guinea pig. So this will be an interesting um, hour, I hope. Uh, thanks. Thank you always to the City Club, to Jim Foster, to Hugh, to all of you for, for Hope and Stanley, my longtime friends who are maybe the longest serving members of the City Club, I, and just all of you for inviting me to speak today at what I consider our nation's premier public forum. I apologize for not being able to attend in person. I was actually at the airport last night thinking I could get there. Uh, the majority leader called us back and said the vote would be this morning. Uh, and it's um, obviously I needed to be here to deal with these debt and deficit issues. I, I also apologize um, especially to Connie Schultz, to my wife Connie. Um, her birthday was yesterday, and I was hoping I could take her to dinner last night. So um, she is uh, – anyway, I, I appreciate all, all that she is and all that she does in, in our lives. Um, thanks to the City Club staff, too, for a, a, a very different – a very kind of different – different sort of session and for the work that you did to get this set up this way. For 100 years, the City Club has been a backdrop for civic leaders and community activists. We celebrate next year our 100th anniversary. It's given so many a chance to speak and to listen and answer to people in this community. Um, I appreciate so much the tradition of the City Club. Every speaker stays to answer questions with the one exception we know of Robert F. Kennedy when he spoke at the City Club the day after the assassination of Dr. King. Uh, he left the stage, uh, my understanding, left the stage in tears and uh, wasn't really, no one really asked him to come back to, to um, answer questions. After I mentioned that, it, it, it was one time recently at the City Club, the City Club was kind enough to send me a photograph of Senator Kennedy speaking that day um, to the City Club, which now hangs in my front office in Washington next to my 
Eagle Scout picture with John Glenn of, of, that was, I believe, taken the same year. But rather than invoking Robert Kennedy today, let me point to people whom I will talk about, like Ronald Reagan and Ben Bernanke and Mitch McConnell and John Boehner. I'll confess Bobby Kennedy's politics are a little more to my liking, but for the issue of the day, whether we default on the obligations of the government of the United States of America for the first time in our history, I'll stick with those four. Each of them is recognized and said as clearly as possible that purely and simply we cannot default on our obligations. Those four understand how harmful and understood how harmful that would be to the vital interest of our country and its citizens. Here's what President Reagan had to say. Quote, the full consequences of a default or even the serious prospect of default by the United States of America are impossible to predict and awesome to contemplate. Denigration of the full faith and credit of the United States would have substantial effects on the domestic financial markets and on the value of the dollar, unquote. Bumping, bumping up against the debt ceiling is nothing new in our country. It was raised 18 times under President Reagan, four times under President Clinton as we move towards a balanced budget, and seven times under George W. Bush. But the attitude toward this issue from a lot of Ronald Reagan's disciples seems to be something new. A substantial share of Speaker Boehner's and Minority Leader McConnell's followers seem unwilling to follow their lead in recognizing that Congress must act. In the next 10 days, Congress must send an increase in the debt ceiling to the president or the damage unquestionably, the damage to the economy and the damage to our nation will be immense. On August 3rd, by one estimate, the Treasury will have receipts of $12 billion and bills of $32 billion. On August 4th, revenues will be $4 billion against $10 billion in committed spending. Also on that date, $90 billion of debt matures and investors may want their money back. It's a crippling pattern day after day after day that would continue. So the president's not engaging in scare tactics when he says he simply cannot guarantee payments to senior citizens and bondholders and all the other obligations of the United States of America. What does this mean for hospitals like Metro and UH and the clinic and their obligations? What does it mean for universities like Case and Kent and, and Tri-C and, and Akron and all of our great Northeastern Ohio universities and colleges? What does it mean for the millions of Ohioans who live month to month on Social Security? Credit costs for all borrowers were cl will climb if there's a default. Governments at every level, businesses, not-for-profits, not homeowners, credit card holders. Several states have been placed on a credit watch, and every state would be hurt by a federal default. My office is being swamped, my Cleveland office and my Washington office alike, with calls from seniors who can't believe this is happening. I can't either. I can live with the politics of all this. That's part of the job. But when it comes to the economy, especially in the midst of a recovery as fragile as this one, Lawmakers ought to suspend the politics. The harm from inaction could be immense, and some of it may already have taken place. Goldman Sachs just came out with a report that suggests consumer confidence and economic activity may have fallen already because of the worries of the default. We need to tackle the deficit, but our approach must be balanced, a combination of spending cuts and increased revenues. When we balanced the budget under President Clinton, spending and revenues were a little less than 20% of the economy. And we had a net gain in those eight years of 21 million, net gain of 21 million private sector jobs. Today's spending has grown to almost 25% and revenues have dropped to about 14.5%, the lowest in 60 years. Economic growth will help, but it will obviously take more than an improving economy to close the budget gap. It will take very difficult choices on competing priorities. Companies across Ohio are trying to do right by their workers and by their communities. Rather than laying people off and just hunkering down, a number of companies are keeping people employed in an effort to improve the company and gain profitability and market share as the economy improves. The federal government has a parallel obligation. We must trim costs to be sure, and we have to do that, and we should do that, but we also need to take a long-term view. We'll only succeed if we continue to make the investments in human capital and basic research and infrastructure that only the federal government can do. Because the debate about the budget deficit is really 
ultimately a debate about job creation. There are millions of Americans who'd rather be working or pay and paying taxes than collecting unemployment insurance or Medicaid or foreclosure assistance from the federal government. We'll never solve the budget problem if we don't solve the jobs problem. And it will be the private sector that makes the thousands and thousands of decisions each month that ultimately lead to millions of jobs over the years ahead. There are a lot of things the government can do to help. Some cost money, some don't. One of the things we can do is stop the policy tilt that has encouraged the disproportionate shift of our economy towards the financial services sector and away from the goods producing sector. Now, before somebody from Key Bank throws a tomato at the screen, um, I'm not talking about traditional banking. Very few businesses of any kind would survive long without a bank, and not a lot of home homeowners, of course, obviously can pay cash for their house. But the house of cards that was built on Wall Street over the past few decades surely was not good for our economy. A few people made a lot of money, but the people of Ohio paid a way too high price. Yesterday was the one-year anniversary of enactment of Dodd-Frank, a bill to address the flaws in our financial regulatory system. There'll probably be refinements needed in this law, like any law. But the notion that we're better off when there's transparency and good consumer protection is not really that debatable. That's why capital from around the world is invested in the United States with confidence. That's why Richard Cordray, the former attorney general who has addressed the City Club before, should be confirmed as the head of the new Consumer Protection Bureau rather than already being treated like some kind of political pinata. Over the past three decades, financial services, get this, financial services went from 11% of our GDP to 21% plus of our GDP. Manufacturing from 30 years ago, 25% of our GDP. Today, manufacturing is only 11% of our GDP. Why does this matter? First, manufacturing jobs pay 20% more on average than service jobs, and they have strong multiplier effects supporting jobs in other sectors of our economy. Think about the auto industry, auto assembly in Cleveland and Northeast Ohio, and how many jobs in Tier 1 and Tier 2 and Tier 3 suppliers. Wealth begins when you make it, when you mine it, or when you grow it. It's hard to see how we can have a strong economy for the next the second hundred years of the City Club without a good manufacturing base. Since the beginning of the recession, we've seen profits at large financial institutions on Wall Street and other service firms increase while our nation's unemployment rate still hovers right around 9%. Unlike wealth created by complex financial products, wealth created by expanded production and manufacturing requires a, a larger workforce, supplier networks, and a whole web of upstream and downstream workers. Second, a strong industrial base is critical to creating economic prosperities and maintain, prosperity and maintaining America's global leadership. The decline of manufacturing corresponded with stagnant wages and increasingly reliance, increasing reliance on credit as far too many families struggle to get by. The past three decades have been tough for middle and low income earners trying to secure a better life for their families. So it's no surprise that many Ohioans, like many Americans, believe that this economy no longer works for them. The big question asked by Ohioans is how we will rebalance that economy, how we will replace it with the hundreds of thousands of Ohio jobs that have been lost, how we will rebuild our middle class. One answer is to look at our strengths. Ohio's strengths are in agriculture. One out of seven jobs in this state is agriculture related. Our strength is in medical and biotechnology innovation, as everyone in Cleveland understands. Ohio ranks second in the country in solar power and solar energy manufacturing jobs. Lake Erie is posed to be poised to be home to the first offshore wind turbine field or farm in the world and in freshwater. Our strength is in aerospace. More than 1,000 Ohio companies support more than 100,000 Ohio jobs in the aerospace industry. In manufacturing, we rank third in the nation behind uh, California, three times our size, and Texas, twice our size in population. We have real assets in financial services with a number of the top 30 banks and insurers in the country and hundreds of smaller institutions too. And look at our strength in the arts. University Circle is a crown jewel of the Midwest, as is, as is the short north in Columbus. Our, strength is, our strengths are in innovation, in our entrepreneurs and our workers and our colleges and universities and our world-class research institutes. 
And something I learned early in this job, some four, four, four and a half or so years ago, as, as Ohio's United States Senator, is the importance of, of bringing together, of convening these strengths, these entities in Ohio to create jobs, to strengthen our economy, and to make Ohio a better place to live and to work. It's critical to a state as complex as ours, from a geography spanning rural communities to big cities, across industries and farms. I've, designed, I've designated a senior level staff person, Jack Dover, who's with you there today, whose main focus is to work with leaders in the public and public private partnerships that leverage these strengths. Many of you know Jack, you can tell his senior level staff position given his gray, gray hair and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Since 2007, uh, we've, in our office, we've, I've personally held about 170 community roundtables across Ohio's at least one in, in each of 88 counties. Many of you have attended them. Uh, it's exposed, it's, it's given me uh, all kinds of good information from community leaders, business leaders, labor leaders, community activists across the state to leverage our state's diverse strengths. Um, we have convened a college president's conference. We've done each of the last four years. We're presidents of um, 55 Ohio colleges and universities, two years and four years, Tri-C and Case and KSU and CSU and Akron and John Carroll and Baldwin Wallace and so many other colleges and universities, 55 in all, have gotten together at my invitation um, once a year in Washington to decide how they can work better together. We have, for the first time, pulled Ohio's three federal facilities, large federal facilities together. I count Battelle and Columbus in this calculation because they, they service um, and, and run uh, America's eight energy labs. But Battelle and NASA Glenn in Cleveland and Wright Pat Air Force Base in Dayton are now talking and you, you can begin to see the synergism coming from these three great institutions and what they can do to drive economic development. And one other group we brought together early in my, a couple, couple three years ago, uh, the president of North American Airbus came to see me. Uh, Airbus buys $10 billion worth of components in the United States and ships them to Toulouse and, and France, to France and Germany for, a, for Airbus assembly. Of those $10 billion worth of, of goods they buy, of products and supplies and component manufacturing items they buy in the United States, of that $10 billion worth of goods, more than $4 billion comes from Ohio. We're the leading Airbus state in the country, and as a result, we convene Jack Dover and I and others, working with Parker in Cleveland, uh, working with Battelle in Columbus, working with the National Composite Center in Dayton, um, convene meetings uh, over about a thousand, more than a thousand people showed up at those three meetings, um, a procurement conference so more Ohio manufacturers could sell into the Airbus supply chain. By doing these kinds of things, leveraging, leveraging these strengths through public partnerships, Ohio remains better prepared to emerge from this recession than we were 30 years ago. And that's an important point to make today. When we came out of the 1981-82 recession, we really went back to business as usual. This time, as we come out of this recession nationally and the national economy takes off, Ohio is so much better suited in clean energy, in, in biotech, in, uh, in aerospace, in healthcare, so many other ways, we are much better positioned to take advantage of that. A common refrain that I've heard from these meetings we've convened and from the roundtables, especially from business leaders and community leaders, is the disparity between jobs in high growth industries like clean energy and bioscience and healthcare and basic manufacturing and the lack of skilled workers who can fill those jobs. It's a huge irony of our time. For too long, workforce development efforts have been developed sort of top down without meeting the needs of local businesses that are part of these local homegrown industries. From the College Presidents Conference and from these roundtables with business leaders came legislation called the Employment Clusters to Organize Regional Success, the so-called Sectors Act. Sectors will help communities develop specialized workforce training programs to meet regional needs. It would connect workers to the needs of emerging industries or clusters. In Northeast Ohio, it means the Workforce Investment Boards, and it means Tri-C or Lakeland or the Lorraine Community College. It means um, businesses and labor leaders teaming up, teaming up with bioscience industry leaders like Baiju Shaw and Bioenterprise to strengthen the local workforce. Sector partnerships have 
have begun to form around health care from the Northern Ohio Health Science and Innovation Coalition to Ohio's renowned health care systems like Metro and UH and the clinic. In Ohio, the idea of industry clusters is nothing new. We saw it in the 1800s. We saw it in the 1900s with glass manufacturing in Toledo. We're now, interestingly, now helping Toledo lead the world in solar panel manufacturing. We've seen it with rubber production in Akron, helping Akron lead the world now in polymers uh, generations later. We've seen it with machine tools in Cincinnati. In the 20th century, we saw it from Dayton to Mansfield, my hometown, to Lordstown, to Cleveland, where auto manufacturing was in many ways a lifeblood of our state and our national economy for about a century. Today, Northwest Ohio is home to solar power, as I said. Central Ohio is home to advanced clean energy through partnerships with Battelle and OSU. In Southwest Ohio, it's aerospace. Earlier this week, John Glenn on Monday turned 90, um, and I met with leading aerospace executives um, that, that evening, coincidentally, at the National Air and Space Museum, including the chairman of Airbus, as I mentioned earlier, how we've begun to connect Ohio suppliers with these contracting opportunities. In the first of these meetings was, was sponsored in Cleveland with Parker, and obviously many other Cleveland companies play, in, play a role in component manufacturing, Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, not just in autos, but in aerospace, too. It's an example of how Ohio's regional economies and clusters are poised for the future. In closing the skills gap, we also leverage another strength of our state, that's manufacturing. Uh, we're third in the nation, and in, in, uh, as I said, we're third in the nation in manufacturing. 16.7% of our state's GDP is generating by, generated by manufacturing $79.9 billion a year. Cleveland's always been a world-class launching pad for inventors and innovators. Household names like uh, Sherwin-Williams and Goodyear and Eaton and so many others have deep roots in Northeast Ohio. All have helped cement this region's status as a business catalyst. But despite this history, we know too well how Ohio lost hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs in the last decade. Despite the decline, we know how to build things in Ohio. The Made in Ohio label has been stamped on everything from airplanes to auto parts to potato chips uh, to uh, soap and to yogurt. Our capacity to outcompete, I guess we don't actually stamp them with potato chips, I guess I sort of wrongly <laughs> spoke there. Our capacity to outcompete and out innovate other countries to create good paying American jobs depends on our capacity to outmanufacture them. Let's be clear manufacturing means sophisticated engineering and innovation found on the factory. On the, in the shop, on the line. It's opportunities for engineers with PhDs and workers with high school diplomas or community college degrees who've mastered a craft over 30 years in labor. Manufacturing expertise is found in our universities, in our business incubators. The National Association of, for the Trade Association for Business Incubators is headquartered in Athens, Ohio. We help to lead the nation in using incubators um, like the one, uh, the, the, the launch house, uh, where I was in Shaker Heights at the old car dealership just a, three, four weeks ago uh, when the mayor and I and others um, un un unveiled or celebrated the opening of, of 35 or 40 young entrepreneurs at the launch house in Shaker doing business, creating jobs, making a difference. We find this at Kent. We find it at Case. We find it at, at the University of Dayton. We find it at Wright Pad Air Force Base at NASA Glenn. And the next generation manufacturing is built in one of the biggest parts of our manufacturing foundation, auto manufacturing. A lot of my Republican colleagues made dire predictions about intervening to save the banking and the auto industries. They were wrong. The money has been mostly paid back to the auto industry, from the auto industry, and GM and Chrysler are making profits. Closer to home, we rescued hundreds of suppliers and dealers, tens of thousands of workers who are the backbone, who are the backbone of Ohio's economy. It wasn't a question of picking winners and losers. That's not it at all. It's a question of, it was a question two years ago, at the end of the Bush years, the beginning of the Obama years, of preventing a depression in Ohio. I don't usually advertise for a particular company or certainly a particular car, but let me tell you about the Chevy Cruze. It's, I believe, first or second top-selling small car, domestic or, or, or foreign, uh, in the United States of America. It's as close to an all-Ohio car as you can get. The engine was made in defiance. 
The bumper is made in Northwood, Ohio, suburb of Toledo. The transmission was manufactured in, in Toledo. Uh, the, the stamping, some of the stamping was done in Parma. The uh, aluminum wheels came from Cleveland's Alcoa. 60 pounds of steel in the, in the Chevy Cruze came from uh, Cleveland Arcelor Middle. And the assembly, some of the rest of the stamping in the assembly was done in Lordstown, Ohio. 5,000 people in the Lordstown plant alone making the cruise, not counting all the thousands I just mentioned and the supply chain leading to it. We need to build on that foundation to ensure that we create American jobs and rebuild America's middle class. How do we do that? Two important components of that are tax policy and trade policy. We need tax policies that create a favorable business climate to foster private sector growth and create jobs at home. These tax credits need to be permanent and predictable for investors and for companies. Our workers need to know that the tax code will help company, companies keep jobs in America rather than reward companies for shipping jobs overseas. There's potential to do much more in the context of overall tax reform as proposed by the so-called in Washington Gang of Six, but that will happen over the course of months or years rather than days. Combined with tax policies, we need trade policies that can help rebuild American manufacturing. With administration backing, trade enforcement has meant more steel jobs in Lorain and Youngstown, more tire jobs in Finley, and more paper jobs in Hamilton. Trade enforcement also means promoting U.S. trade exports. As a member of the President's Export Council, I believe there are, there are seven or eight House and Senate members on that council, I'm working to ensure Ohio's small businesses have the leverage, can leverage federal resources to export into new markets. My office has convened a series of small business and export seminars across Ohio. We've connected some 2,500 participants to help them find capital and financing to enter new markets. Every country practices trade. Every rich, industrialized Western country practices trade according to its national interest. We seem too often to practice trade according to a textbook that's 20 years out of date. We need more trade, not less, but we need trade and tax policies that provide a level playing field for our manufacturers, especially our small manufacturers, and our workers. Never has it been a common business practice in our nation's history, as far as I know, for an American company to outsource jobs overseas only to sell product back here at home that that's the business plan for far too many companies to, to shut down manufacturing in this country, move it thousands of miles away, and then ship the products back to our country. We're still the country that does more innovation and more technology development than any country in the world. The designers, for instance, at Cleveland's Nottingham Spurk are, cho are chasing Thomas Edison in the number of patents they receive. My understanding is they're, they're at 400 and counting. Good for them. Uh, like LeBron, Edison left Ohio for the bright lights. Of course, the lights weren't so bright because he hadn't yet invented them. But we lose that edge when we outsource manufacturing jobs because we also outsource our innovation. Let me tell you about a manufacturing company in Minster, Ohio. Minster's north of Dayton in the same county where uh, Neil Armstrong was raised. Um, I was visiting that plant as I visit dozens and dozens of Ohio manufacturers. It's the largest yogurt manufacturer in North America. They make Dan and yogurt. Um, I, I was going through the shop. They used to, um, at, at that plant, they used to bring their, a supplier would sell the little plastic cups. Uh, they had these big vats where the, where the milk would be fermenting into yogurt, and they'd squirt the yogurt into these plastic cups, and they'd package it and prepare them to, for, 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 uh, for sale. Uh, a, a young engineer who looked to be about 14 to me and two, um, two people that had worked on the line for many years came up with this new idea about a, about a hundred, about a, probably a 75 foot machine they built where they just, they took a roll of plastic, they slowly, they fed the sheet of plastic into this new machine they had built. It slowly heated the plastic, it extruded the plastic into cup shape, uh, then cooled the plastic, then squirted the yogurt in, all in about a 75 foot line, all packaged, ready to go. It's, it's that kind of innovation done on the shop floor. If Dan and Yogurt, if the Minster plant had been in another country, the innovation would have taken place in that other country. We don't continue to lead the world in innovation if we innovate and invent and innovate and ship those jobs, the production jobs overseas. The real continued innovation takes, care of, takes place abroad and we don't get it. It's that 
outsourcing of shop floor innovation that undermines ultimately our economic competitiveness. The loss of innovation is why we're seeing more wind turbines and solar panels coming from China and Germany. 70% of clean energy systems now are made abroad, even though the technologies were invented here, often with taxpayer support. For instance, first wind turbine technology, the technology that, that, that companies use all over the world now, was developed about 40 miles west, 50 miles west of where you sit at NASA's Plum Brook facility in the 1970s in Sandusky, Ohio. We can stem the tide by scaling up and pro promoting our own innovation and entrepreneurship. Ohio's already ahead of the curve, as I've seen in, in my Made in Ohio tour, as I um, travel this state and talk to farmers, talk to small businesses, talk to manufacturing, visiting Ohio's hometowns that are indeed the backbone of our economy. Because of the work of so many of you, Lake Erie can be home to the world's fresh, first freshwater wind farm. We must, create, uh, the, the, we must create the fertile soil for entrepreneurs to flourish while giving existing small businesses the resources they need to expand to add jobs to hire new workers. Enterprises like Jumpstart and Nortec and BioEnterprise and Team Neo and Magnet help entrepreneurs in Northeast Ohio. They remind us that we can also support Ohio's small businesses by supporting incubators which help startups focus on expanding their businesses rather than worrying about their overhead. Northeast Ohio, as I mentioned earlier, is already home to several successful business incubators, including, including uh, the manufacturing, uh, manufacturing Advocacy and Growth Network in Cleveland, the Akron Global Business Accelerator, and the Youngstown Business Incubator. But our greatest strength is finding the capacity to work with one another and develop relationships with groups around the state that share the same objectives. It means working with the Greater Cleveland Partnership, the Columbus Partnership, the Dayton Development Coalition to leverage federal resources, which I try to do every day, working with Jack Dover and finding ways to convene people and, and, and get businesses talking to one another in schools and universities and job training and entrepreneurs and startups to get them working together to promote local development in our communities. It's about stepping in to save the Hugo Boss Plan in Brooklyn, Ohio which we were able as a group with the governor and others about a year ago. It's about the 100 years of evolution in American manufacturing. Look at Hugo Boss, it means a seamstress hand is now assisted by a laser's precision. It's about building a city landscape and creating good paying jobs. It's about attracting and retaining our talented young people. 100 years ago, Newton Baker and Mayo Fessler and Daniel Edgar Morgan, namesakes of a city's history, established a city club. They did so recognizing the power of one's voice in telling the story of our nation. For the last five years, as a United States Senator, I've listened and I've learned much from the people of Ohio. Managers and workers, students and seniors, folks looking for work, those who have it, those who provide the jobs for them. To be sure, there is pain and there is hardship in our state. But the stories I hear are also about perseverance and they're about resiliency. Ohioans in the nation are recognizing our state's unique role in our state's sh shining future, not just as a bellwether for presidential politics every leap year, but as a state with great facilities, great medical facilities, great universities. It's a state with a rich manufacturing heritage and a spirit of innovation. It's a state that's increasingly known in America and in the world as a leader in clean energy, in biotechnology, in aerospace. It's a state that I continue to be honored to represent. I thank you, and I thank you for uh, allowing me to do this Skype today. I, I will take your questions. Thanks. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday forum featuring the Honorable Sherrod Brown, U.S. Senator from Ohio. We will now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone here, including guests. Holding the microphone today are 100th anniversary intern Phil Williams and program director Carrie Miller. And when you uh, ask a question to help out Sherrod Brown uh, get oriented, feel free to uh, state your name uh, before you ask your question if you're willing to do so. And you may need to wait a moment uh, to allow for the transfer of uh, technology to, to take place. First question, please. Hello, Sherrod. I'm Pat Carey. 
um, I'm probably going to ask the question that anybody else would ask as the first question, and that is, what is your response to the budget proposal coming out of uh, the president in uh, Boehner's office today? We um, uh, thank you, Pat. Uh, we don't know the we don't know precisely what it is yet. Um, uh, we've heard all kinds of rumors that it's um, it, 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 we we. What we start with, we know the president has asked for um, more sort of shared sacrifice that the president has asked for um, both revenues to be included and cuts. With the cuts, we know will be um, a higher proportion of the revenues. Uh, I don't know what form that's going to take. I've looked at, I'm encouraged by the gang of six coming out with um, some reasonable proposals. I, I have questions. There are many unanswered questions about the gang of six, too, in terms of what they put out, because it's there, there are a few details yet. We have some general guidelines. Uh, in the end, I, it's, it's so important that we, obviously, that, that we deal with, with keeping the U.S. out of default. So I, I look at this. I will look at any proposal that comes out with, with that, obviously, in mind. Um, I'm also encouraged by the, by the McConnell-Reed compromise, which... Uh, is a, is a fairly complex way of looking at this. It's, it's pretty political coming out of Mitch McConnell's office. We know that, but um, we also know, I also know that it, it probably gets us where we need to go by, by keeping us out of default uh, and then forcing Congress in a bit of a base closed commission kind of construct, forcing Congress to come up with, with a, a real plan to move us more towards a balanced budget um, in the years ahead and, and giving Congress an up or down vote so you can't sort of amend it to death. So I, I'm hopeful that, that I'd like to see the McConnell-Reed proposal be the one that we vote on. Um, I'm not yet clear what, what Speaker Boehner and the President have come, will, will come out with. The Speaker, um, the, the, the negotiations have pretty much been the Speaker and the President, not House Democrats, not Senate Republicans, not Senate Democrats. It's pretty much been the two of those. And I, I'm not at all certain that what uh, John Boehner agrees to can get through, can pass pass the muster with with Republican freshmen. A large number of them have said they will vote for no debt limit increase because they don't think that that's a significant problem for our country if if we go into default, or they don't believe not that rate not that failure to raise the debt ceiling will end us end us in default. And I think they are spectacularly wrong. Is almost every economist of 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 almost any reasonable economist and business leaders and others think. I also, one more point, is I know that um, business leaders have really stepped up in the last week, um, all, most of them assuming, as one, I had dinner with I had dinner with a CEO at this aerospace meeting I was at recently. I had dinner with a, a CEO from Pittsburgh of an aerospace supply company, and she said to me, she said, I just expected you guys would fix this. Well, when I started coming to Capitol Hill in the last couple of days, she said this on Monday night, um, I began to realize how we really need to step up, especially to House Republicans and tell them this is really serious. You can't play political games no matter what your philosophy. You don't do this to score political points. So in a nutshell, I want to see the proposal, obviously, before I decide. Um, I, 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 I know we have to stay out of default. Hi, Senator Brown. Uh, Charles Patton here. On my, way, on my way driving downtown this morning, I was on Harvard, <clears throat> about 90th Street, uh, across the bridge that went over a railroad track, and a sign said, closed to pedestrian, pedestrian traffic. Middle of the bridge, I noticed the sidewalk was just gone. It, it had just buckled, caved down, fallen on the track. Question is, I know you're going through some budget issues now with the debt ceiling. What are the chances of something being done in D.C. to get some jobs created to fix some of the infrastructure throughout the country, like this bridge that just fell down that's probably 100 years old also at least? Thank you. Thank you, Charles, for that. I, I'm, you know, I, we, talk, we talk all the time about the budget deficit that are, we bequeath to our children. Um, I go back 10 years when we had a budget surplus, and uh, Alan Greenspan and some others said, well, we've got to, we've got to spend it. We can't have too big a surplus. We've got to do tax cuts. Overwhelmingly, that went to, um, you know, to the upper 2 or 3% of people in income. Um, and we ended up, as you know, pay, going to war, to two, engaging in two wars. Uh, and we financed those wars by, um, by sending the bills, basically the Chinese fans, foreign, a lot of Chinese money financed the wars and our budget deficits from the Medicare bill and from that. Um, 
I, 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 so I, as much as I worry about the budget deficit for our future, I, I worry as much about the infrastructure deficit in this country. And that, that's not just highways and bridges in the city of Cleveland. It's that, to be sure. It's water and sewer systems. We know what, what's happened with, with the cost of, of, of water and sewer in Northeast Ohio. Uh, and and it's, also, it's also broadband, and it's also the cost of college educations for working class, middle class, and, and, and low-income Ohioans. Uh, it's increasingly hard to get a college degree um, without huge debt. Uh, and in all of that, I, I, I've talked, my, my wife Connie has said many times to me that when she went to Kent, she, she was able to go to Kent. Uh, her dad was carried a union card for 37 years. She and her three younger siblings all went to college. Um, she graduated without much debt because in those days, the federal government, she got some scholarships, but in those days, the federal government stepped up with Pell Grants and other things to make college more affordable, more accessible. So I, I, I worry a lot about what do we do in the next 10 years um, in terms of the infrastructure, education, and, and water, sewer, highway, bridge kind of infrastructure, public transit, um, then in, in RTA and, and what Mr. Calabrese has talked to me about many times in Cleveland. And, and so I, I'm hopeful one of the things I think the most important, one of the most important things we can do is set up an infrastructure bank where, um, you know, we use kind of the, the sort of financing that state government uses um, to, to have a sort of a separate budget item on how you, how you borrow and how you do infrastructure in this country. Um, it's clear that when we were, you know, when we were a poorer country 50 years ago, 60, 50 years ago, I guess, we were able to build an, we were able to build a, a, an interstate system and we, we put real money into real infrastructure and, and water and sewer and highways and bridges. And we've got to, we've got to find a way to finance this so that we can prepare for the future better. Because it's, it's not just about putting people to work right now. It's clearly long-term economic development. It's what we really owe our kids. Hi, Senator. Uh, my name is Brian. Uh, my question, you talk uh, uh, a lot about the raise of the debt ceiling. Obviously, it's a big issue right now. Um, but early in your Senate career, you did vote uh, against raising the debt ceiling. Um, when uh, President Obama was uh, – was, uh, uh, they addressed the same vote to him. He did admit that it was, uh, it was a political ploy. And uh, would, you, would you share the same sentiment, that it was a political vote? Um, there, there have, as I said, there have been dozens and dozens of times when the debt ceiling was raised, 18 times under President Reagan, seven times under President Bush. A uh, number of times, I think four under President Clinton, if I recall. Um, I voted for it. Sometimes I voted against it sometimes. I, I have, but I never made it, I never engaged in this kind of political hostage taking, nor did any of my colleagues in either party. When President Reagan was president, most of the Democrats, I assume, voted against the debt ceiling because they wanted to quietly protest some of his policies. When President Clinton was president, Republicans voted against raising the debt ceiling because they wanted to quietly protest some of his policies. I did that with President, with President Bush. I never, nor did my colleagues in either party until this day, risk the full faith and credit of the United States of America by holding out on the debt ceiling like this and, and trying to extract, trying to extract political, make political points and extract political promises the way that House Republicans are doing this. And it's, it's, it's pretty outrageous. Again, voting against it's one thing, um, and, but, the, but the party and the majority in each house needs to take responsibility for that. Nobody wants to, nobody do. wants to Everybody, do. of course, would rather vote against it because nobody much likes it. But I, I, don't, take, I don't take a backseat to anybody on, on getting to a balanced budget. I voted for the 1993 Clinton budget. No Republican in either house voted that way. We got to a balanced budget by 2000, 21 million private sector jobs created. We left the largest budget surplus in American history in 2001 when President Bush took office. Two wars not paid for, a Medicare privatization bill that was a, basically a bailout to drug and insurance companies not paid for, tax cuts for the rich not paid for, financed in large part by Chinese dollars or by, 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 by the Chinese, our dollars, but by the Chinese through huge trade deficits. Um, and, you know, now those same people that helped to create that budget, turning it from the biggest budget surplus to the biggest budget deficit in eight short years, are now trying to hold the government hostage and, more importantly, are putting in jeopardy our, our all-too-anemic 
our economic growth, and I think they should be ashamed of themselves. Hi, Senator. Uh, Pat Blahoviak from East Cleveland. I'd like to thank you for your support of wind energy and for your support of Jack Dover, who's a big supporter of geothermal, which is really terrific. Um, a number of years ago, we talked about nuclear power, and at that point I expressed my opposition, and you thought it was, at that time, less unsafe than it had been. Um, in light of Fukushima, Jaitapur, India, recurrent problems at Davis Bessie, leakage at Perry, Diablo Canyon on a on a fault line, the problems in Omaha, cost overruns in Maryland. Approximately, I think it was 37 facilities built in the U.S. on the same model as the Japanese model, lack of updates for um, evacuation plans. What would it take for you to reverse your support for nuclear power? I think you characterize it slightly wrong, Pat, but, but close enough. Um, I, I am not sure about nuclear power. I, um, I have, over the years, begun to think it's safer than I thought 20 years ago. Um, I, again, as the American public is, are, are, are rethinking um, because of some of your... I, I don't think it's... it's I, I introduced the first solar energy bill, which became law in the Ohio legislature in 1970. I think it was. It was at least 30 plus years ago. And I'm a big believer in solar and wind, wind power and biomass and, 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 and fuel cells and all the kinds of things that technology can bring us. I don't think that's going to be enough. Um, I, I don't oppose coal. I think that coal can be burned cleaner, but I also know that coal is not going to solve our energy problems, but, but are part of our energy solutions for a number of years. And, I, and I'm concerned about nuclear. I had some meetings recently with a scientist who probably knows more about fusion, which is sort of the opposite of fission, nuclear fission. Um, its power is generated by pulling atoms apart, breaking them up. Those of you who are uh, case engineering and other students here, and I know there's a lot of students in the audience, <laughs> bear with me on this because I'm not an expert on this. The difference between fusion is putting, in, or putting particles and uh, in, in atoms together, producing energy. Um, fusion is, is, if anything, is limitless, might be, and is, is cleaner and all that. Um, we probably don't invest enough in fusion in this country, it, it, but I've heard for 30 years it may be an energy in the future. It hasn't seemed to be yet. The guy I was talking to is, is an expert, and I'm talking to him more and working with him. But I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure what the right answers are. I, I do know that with nuclear power, in too many cases, the industry has captured the regulators, similar to the Wall Street, Wall Street too often captured the regulators, particularly in the OCC, um, the awesome controller of the currency, but too often to try, uh, capture the regulators, especially during the Bush years, and that's one of the reasons where we, we had the terrible financial problems. I, I have those same fears in the nuclear industry that, that the nuclear industry has too often captured the term regulatory capture, a sort of political science term where they have had too much influence with the people doing the regulating. You saw that in Japan. I think you probably saw it, I think, at Three Mile Island. You surely saw it in the Soviet Union, um, where whatever the regulators there really meant, they really had nothing on, um, on Chernobyl. I mean, they really did nothing about that except denied it happened for a while afterwards. I mean, all of those things I, I'm very concerned about. I don't know the answer. Um, I think we've got to figure out what our real energy policy is and begin to fund the research that gets us there. I'm not willing yet to dismiss nuclear power, but I think they've got some things to prove to us. Hello, Senator Brown. This is Ann Hill from Metro Health. And a few months ago, you uh, were at Metro Health to do a press conference about a drug which um, was for the purpose of preventing premature babies. And the KV Pharmaceuticals had greatly hiked the price of that drug and put it out of reach for families. And I'm wondering if you can update us on what happened with that effort to, to deal with that problem and also if, if there are other cases like that um, around the country that you and others are trying to deal with. Thank you, Ann, for that question. Yes, um, there is an update. Uh, yesterday, the chairman of the aging committee, Senator Cole from Wisconsin, asked me to come to his committee and um, be part of his deliberations, which is not that common to go to another committee's um, meeting because the, the, one of the leading scientists and one of the leading administrators at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services there in the Department of Health and Human Services who, who was working on the cost of these drugs. 
to fill people in quickly, there is a compounding pharma. Uh, there's a there's a, a pharmacy compound made by pharmacists themselves in their in their offices or in their labs, um, which was a very safe drug. It's been in, it's been around for a number of years. Called P17. It's a progesterone, and it's given to women who have had uh, a history of 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 early term um, births. And so um, this drug is given once a week for the 20 weeks before, uh, before birth, before the, the, the nine-month birth. And uh, that it has helped an awful lot of women in this country, tens of thousands, have safe pregnancies and healthy babies. It's given once a week for 20 weeks. The cost of this compounded drug, this pharmacy compound it's called, um, this P- progesterone, was 10 to $20 a dose, which means times 10, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know 100, 100, $200, I'm sorry, times 20, 200 to $400 for 20 weeks. A company named KV Pharmaceuticals out of St. Louis came to the FDA and said, we want to, uh, we, we want to do some clinical trials on this and we want to market. We'll get seven years exclusivity. Nobody else could then sell it, but we will make it safely in large doses and more people will have access. They were given that permission. They went through it. They got seven years exclusivity. They raised the price from 10 to $20 a dose to $1,500 a dose, therefore costing a woman $30,000 for this life-saving drug in so many ways. Um, I immediately wrote to this company. I wrote to the FDA. I wrote to CMS. I asked them to intervene. When the company sent a cease and desist order, to all these pharmacy, these compound pharmacists around the country, FDA did something, I believe, unprecedented or almost unprecedented. They told the compounding pharmacies to ignore the cease and desist order, basically saying to the compounding pharmacy, keep making that drug as long as you're doing it safely and as long as women are benefiting from it at that low cost, we will not tell you to stop. Um, since then, Makina, Makina, the name of the drug, KB Pharmaceuticals, brought the price down from under pressure from $1,500 to $690 a dose. Still, you know, I don't know, 40, 50 times what was being charged before. So um, we are working with doctors and hospitals, encouraging them to continue to use progesterone, the P17 compounded pharmacy compound. Don't use the Makina drug. Um, and we're trying to get Medicaid to say, to tell all of its pay or all of its um, its partners, if you will, places like Metro and UH and and other hospitals, um, and smaller, bigger hospitals, to only use this this less expensive drug. It's outrageous what that company did. They should be ashamed of themselves. Apparently, they're not. Um, there are two or three, and in, in further response, and I don't mean to talk this to death. There are two or three other drugs where we've seen some, some, a drug called Avastin that some of you know about, and a gout drug called, um, if I can remember, Colchris, I think Colchris. And they, they, this one company, this drug Colchris, went from four cents a dose, and I think it's a daily dose. Any of you in the audience that have gout know how pain, knows how painful it is. I think it went from four cents to um, 50 cents, something like that. Those numbers aren't necessarily precise, but um, they did the same kind of thing by gaming the FDA system. So um, we've got work to do to make sure this doesn't happen again and, and, and um, protect the public health. Thanks for asking. Good afternoon, Senator. Cheryl Hoffman, Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Thank you for recently joining us for the opening of the PNC Smart Home. I'd like to ask how you think the cultural institutions and particularly the science institutions here in Cleveland can help you in engaging in dialogues, uh, forums, task force for education and reaching out to our young people from K through 12 on through university level. Thank sure. Thanks very much. I appreciate that. And um, thanks to the, the Smart House, um, Paul Clark and PNC and others from, from natural history and other people in the community were um, sort of celebrated this um, incredibly energy efficient home, which I think is going to be moved to the edge of University Circle and then sold to some lucky person lucky enough to get to live there. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know, you know, I, I think that I, I'm amazed how few people around Ohio um, know about the incredible work that Chris Renane and, and Terry Hamilton Brown before and all of you at University Circle do. I mean, what, what's with the botanical gardens and case and, and, and severance and 
uh, the Crawford Museum and, and you know, the incredible, th the, the Veterans Hospital is, and the, the two big hospitals, obviously UH and, and the clinic and the Veterans Hospital expansion there. I mean, it is a jewel um, beyond almost anything in the Midwest. And I, I, I know that a good arts community, a vibrant arts community, and that's way more than the arts, obviously, in, in University Circle, but a vibrant arts community um, brings so much with it. The, the, the brilliant people, the creativity, the, the people that want to live in, a, in an area that has such an, a terrific, makes such a terrific contribution to the community. And I, I just think working with the Cleveland Partnership and working with all of you in that audience who, in this audience who know so much about University Circle and spend a lot of time there, recreation and work both, that we've got to figure a way to make this this much better known and, and much more engaged somehow to do job growth and to make our city even more attractive. I mean, there, there's just no place quite like it. And every time I'm in University Circle, I, I learn something new that I didn't know was there. And um, I just encourage others. I wish I had a more specific, prescriptive answer how to make it work. Um, I'm always open w with you, Ms. Hoffman, and anybody else in University Circle to, to just make it even more of a gem. Thanks. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been listening to a Friday forum featuring U.S. Senator Sherrod Brown. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.